Hello. Um, welcome to Roll Call. My name is Kayla McNabb. I'll be your host this evening. Uh, we are going to be talking about our Sandman one shot from a few weeks ago. Um, this is a follow up to that recording, uh, and we're going to be doing this from now on. So uh, eventually, it'll be about two or three weeks after each uh, roll of play session, we'll be doing this sort of roll call recap. Um, but right now, we're working through that backlog. Uh, if you have questions for our panelists, please feel free to put those in the chat on Twitch. Uh, and after today, we will also be using the hashtag uh, VTUL roll call uh, to collect questions before each roll call session. Uh, but with that, I think I will go ahead and hand it over to our players uh, to introduce themselves. Um, if you could just give us um, who you are, your pronouns, uh, your job. Um, at VT and just a reminder of who your character was um, and we were all bards so we don't have to go through uh, class you can talk about your college if you'd like um, who's first on the rotation it's Jonathan but he's not a player uh, Lee oh. Ouch. <laughs> hi um, my name is Lee Walters I work in I use she her pronouns I work in Pamplin College of Business and International Programs, advising students for study abroad programs and internships. Um, my character was Clown, and I don't remember what kind of bard he was. That is the difficulty of doing this like two and a half months later or something. Yeah, yeah for sure. That's why we want to <laughs> not do it two and a half months later. Right. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, Kira. My name is Kira Dietz, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am the assistant director of Special Collections and University Archives. I played Nithvari, who was a tiefling bard, and yes, I am totally cheating with my character sheet in front of me from this game. <laughs> uh, and she was a College of Swords bard, which turned out to be a lot of fun to play. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I also played in this game. And I didn't grab my notes. I'm woefully <laughs> unprepared. <laughs> Who am I? Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll circle back to that. Um, both <laughs> I and my character use she, her pronouns. Um, I do know that. That's something that I've got. Um, I will go ahead and have um, Jonathan introduce himself. And we'll do an overview of the work of literature in a little bit. So if you just want to introduce yourself, who you are, what do you, right. what do, you do here? Uh, I'm Jonathan Bradley. I am the head of Studios and Innovative Technologies for the University Libraries. I was the GM for this particular game. Uh, so I am excited to talk about it. It is a great series. And if you weren't aware, it's getting adapted into a Netflix special, uh, which is exciting. Uh, they announced the cast for it recently, and I like their picks, um, so I'm interested to see how it goes. Awesome. Well, normally I would want to start with the questions from the audience, but I think at this point we don't have any yet, but we're going to get there. <laughs> so we'll start with questions um, from each other. Does anyone have any questions for any of the other players or for Jonathan as the GM? Oh, see, now you didn't tell us we yeah. also had to have questions. You can, <laughs> I thought we were here to answer You can answer think questions. about them now. I'll ask, I'll ask the first question. So I give no were... answers. I provide only <laughs> mysteries. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was kind of that game in a nutshell. Yes. <laughs> it's true. Uh, what were your expectations going into this session? We can start there. For like anybody yeah. that the open yeah. question. Any anyone who wants to jump in on that. I have the answer of not really having any expectations. I have was uh I'm a bad nerd in that I was not nearly as familiar with this work as I should have been. So um I was like and I've also never played a bard. This was my first bard ever. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'm going to go into this with no expectations and see what happens. Um, so for me, that was really exciting because I was like, I don't know about bards. But then the more I started building it, I was like, oh, I'm really excited to play this bard. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and once I started figuring out the mechanics for that, um, I really liked it. So potentially we'll play Bard again someday. Mm. <laughs> Wood Bard again. Excellent. Wood Bard again. Hashtag Wood Bard uh, again. I, <laughs> yeah, not 10 out of 10, but... <laughs> How dare you. Um, I expected... I've never played a Bard before. But I sort of expected that we would all die at the first confrontation, <laughs> which we almost did. So um, that was cool. Uh, I, al- I was also excited about being able to play something based around Sandman. I knew it was going to be something like very fantasy, twisty, maybe a little confusing, lots of riddles and like mysterious workings of gods outside of the mortal realm. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, but I enjoyed playing a bard. I don't know if I'd ever play a bard again, but it was fun. <laughs> Hashtag would not bard again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would. I, I would also say I did not expect Ithfari to lose an eye, but hey, that was a thing. That <laughs> yeah, if you were more familiar with the work, you might have suspected that a little more. <laughs> I might have suspected that. That was my own uh, lack of being informed. <laughs> uh, for the record, in the playtest, uh, a character also lost an eye. So, um, yeah. it's not a guarantee that you'll lose an eye, but there's a grapple mechanic. And honestly, that's a part of D&D that I, has, I've always thought about a lot. So, there's the grapple mechanic, and a lot of creatures have it, and a lot of people ignore it. Because, really, all it does to your characters means they can't move away. And so, if someone's grappled and they're a melee character, a lot of times they're like, ah, big deal. And I'm guilty of this, too. And so, that is specific there are a handful of monsters that really make you pay if you don't break the grapple though but a lot of people sort of metagame and are aware of those monsters and so there was going into it i was like there could be a pretty harsh surprise for some people and my because i was like if they don't know the story (laughs) and they don't know what he's all about the corinthian is is who we're speaking about um they could pay pretty dearly for not breaking the grapple and using your like action to, to try to get away from him College of Swords Bard gonna fight. I'm, that's, <laughs> I'm gonna swords, fight. That's what I was gonna Swords gonna, gonna slash. <laughs> yep. That's that's what you're made for. I mean, I uh, this was not my first Bard. Um, I do have her name now. I rem- I pulled it up. Um, I didn't remember it. Uh, Trinian uh, Silver Thread, a College of Eloquence Bard. Um, mm. Not my first Bard. Hashtag Wood Bard again. Just all Won't be your last bard. Won't be my Hashtag last bard. bard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and College of Eloquence is definitely um, more up my alley than College of Swords. Though it's really, like, as someone who's never played a fighter, um, like a straight-up fighter in a long-term campaign, uh, I think it would be an interesting toe into that water personally wait wait if we can get the hashtag get kayla to play a bard trending or get kayla to play a fighter trending will you play a fighter if it's literally trending on twitter absolutely (laughs) absolutely uh take up that um that flag crusade internet yeah sure i gotta go (laughs) (laughs) gotta get out of here yeah i mean sure why not um i was a barbarian for two sessions um that one time so you know there's that um i mean you should clarify it was a one shot you didn't die after two sessions no (laughs) yeah (laughs) no it was a one shot that lasted two sessions as many one shots do um Mm -hmm. but ours are not allowed to so um mm, we're getting an echo Mm. Uh let's see here fight kayla fight um (laughs) I mean, as for my expectations, I don't know if I was really included in the expectations listing uh, as as uh, who was supposed to answer that, but um, I expected a little bit of... Um, so I wasn't really sure what to expect when it came to how y'all handled some of the challenges because they aren't... Aside from the fight with the Corinthian, which was fairly straightforward D&D battle, most of the challenges you faced were storytelling in nature they were role-playing style things and I wasn't sure how you'd respond to those so in terms of expectations I was a little nervous 
Um, in the play test, when we got to the um, section in which the three um, guardians of um, Dreams Castle demand stories in order for you to continue, uh, some of the players in the in the um, play test just gave like song lyrics from like modern songs, um, and while that was funny, it was also sort of like come on this is your chance to like role play and and grab a hold of it so i did really appreciate that everybody um uh went in with like actually telling the story and and meeting that challenge the way it was sort of expected i know that one's hard because you got to basically like create a fake story off the top of your head um in a in a moment's notice but i think that is in keeping with the sandman as like the creator of dreams and, and by extension, the creator of tales. Um, so challenging, but also like fun. And then the other things that y'all did were also similarly, even the final battle in which you had to describe your actions and you told the story of your victory and those just dictated your roles and the damage that you were doing and, and became part of this tale. Um, all of that, I didn't know how long it would take you to figure out. Um, but as I recall, you figured it out fairly quickly. So that was good. Yeah. As a person who is trying to come up with things, um, we should probably have like a primer before folks play and like taking a solid nap before game time, <laughs> I think would have been very helpful because trying the, to <laughs> like take the yeah. pre-game session where we set everything up and yep. just extend it. And it's like, take yep. a nap and yep. Everyone like, takes set, a power up, nap. Then set up your OBS and then like... Yep. <laughs> yep, exactly. Everyone takes a power nap, gets their caffeinated beverage of choice, because there were some moments. Prepare for heavy lifting. Right, where I was <laughs> like, it's like nine o'clock. I, I can't do anything, uh, <laughs> anything interesting anymore. Um. <laughs> See, that's my creative time, so I was down with this. I was like, yes, now I have to write poetry on the fly at 9 p.m. Got it. Finally, you know how long I've been waiting for someone to ask me to do that? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> oh, me. Yeah. Um, let's see here. We've we've already talked a little bit about characters. I've got a couple of questions uh, related to characters, unless y'all have come up with questions for each other that we want to divert to. I don't, no, okay. I think you should keep going with okay. your questions. Um, so... For this one, it was a little bit, um, a little bit different than some of the other sessions, right? We were all required to be bards. Um, there haven't been any other sessions where we were dictated a class. Um, so, do you feel like your character was well suited for this adventure? So this is for for us players. Um, you know, we were we were hemmed in a little bit, but bards are very versatile. As a pro bard person, <laughs> uh, I have to mention. Um, how well suited did you feel? Uh, I think for for the what we were doing, I think it was probably fine. Like any sort of character would have been fine because so much of it was role play based. Um, and actually, it probably would have been a hindrance if I had picked like a fighter because then I probably would have tried to punch my way through. <laughs> most of the problems so uh, having a bard was great because it limited me to do the correct things <laughs> probably <laughs> or at least close to the correct thing right yeah, I mean I would, I would say the same like this was a really great chance to explore bard and we had a little bit of information going into it so I specifically picked college of swords because I'd never played a bard but I tend to I used to tend towards fighter background, so I thought, well, there's a way that I can put these two things together and play these elements up. And in the end, I was actually really excited with the way I had chosen to sort of think about that character because I think it worked out really well when we were putting on our strange little performance, circus troupe performance uh, at the inn and, um, you know, how I sort of played that, how I was able to play that out later. So for me, I think it was really cool and it was a really great way to explore Bard, so... Um, probably didn't use all the magic that I planned for, so that might have been the only thing that like I would have wanted to explore a little more of. Mm -hmm. But I think I picked some of the right spells, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's always so hard, especially in a one shot, right? Like, 
knowing what you're going to need in any given session is hard enough, much less when that one session is the whole story that you're trying to <laughs> collaboratively tell. Um, yeah. And once we all figured out, remembered to inspire each other, <laughs> it was really beneficial. That's sort of the trick of bards. That's what happens. You put a bunch of people who've never played bards. They're like, well, I'm doing what Yeah, now? that inspiration is clutch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I can give a little bit of background about why. So yeah, in our in my personal uh, gaming group, uh, we've joked for a long time about running an all bards campaign. Um, semi serious, semi joking, I guess. Um, and part of me sat down one day and I was like, if I was going to run an actual like adventure that was all bards, like how could you do it where it wasn't just you have to play a bard and you really could have played whatever, but you like it makes sense for everybody to be a bard uh, and when I started thinking about it I started getting into like they should be like a troop or some sort of group that travels together and performs and then I was like well then that would mean the adventures need to surround something about performing and I got into the idea of storytelling um, and like losing words and then it just sort of it naturally snapped in my head to like um, dream and and some of the things that um, are in the Sandman series, and I was like, ooh, and then and then we started doing roll call, and and so actually like, and I guess for background and context about how this works, the Sandman was actually the first one shot we made for roll call or or for role the role play, play. Um, and it was actually play tested a long time ago. It was over the summer, um, and it was it was supposed to air uh, on like April fifteenth. Uh, or no, April yeah, April 1st was going to be uh, our first day, and we weren't going to do the role play on that day, but April 15th was what we had scheduled to actually do um, the first episode of the role play, and it was supposed to be, I think at that time we'd, we'd said we might do uh, the Sandman, but um, it, it made sense, and it, it got a chance for me to dive into a story that I really love, um, and so I did want people to be thinking about problems from the perspective of, like, how could I tell a story, and how could I overcome this with words and performance, more so than magic, more so than um, anything along those lines. So uh, I was I was happy that... Um, I know it always is sort of tough when you feel like reined in um, by like forcing classes and stuff on players, but I think y'all handled it really well, and um, that that's always nice to see as a GM when you're running a one shot and just hoping everything doesn't get derailed and is complete chaos. <laughs> Bards are the most versatile class. Um. <laughs> I don't know that anybody was arguing uh, to the opposite at that moment. I think this, this is just some pro bard propaganda. This is being sponsored by Big Bard. Hashtag not sponsored. No. Hashtag not sponsored. No. Oh. Hashtag not sponsored. oh goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's helpful. And if um, this might also be a good point. If you could give us a little bit of description of the work and its context, if folks either have never read it or didn't see the session and are tuning in just because they're interested uh, in what we're doing here. Maybe yeah. Just a little bit of so the summary. Sandman is, um, it's a series of, I mean, it started out as a series of comic books and then comic books, if they do well, always get collected into a graphic novel. Um and it was a long-running series, and it started in, I believe, the 80s and hit the 90s um, as it ran. Um, I'd have to check the dates on when it actually um, officially started. But it was written by Neil Gaiman. It had numerous different artists over the years. Um, the one that always stood out to me was Dave McKean, uh, who is still um, a very widespread artist um, and, and does a lot of... Um, I mean, I think it's fantastic art, but it's sort of surrealist and it's styling and it made a lot of sense for a, huge portions of the Sandman in that there's dreams and there's these strange scenes and everything. Um, the story follows the, the Lord of Dreams, Morpheus, and at the beginning of the story, he's been trapped, and I think it's for 70 years or so. And during that time, um, 
people are are unable to dream and it's becoming a very serious problem um, he was trapped in a mistake it, they were actually trying to catch his sister who is death and that way no one would ever die and that was the logic of the people who trapped him but he is part of a, f a family uh, known as the endless and they are all embodiments of some aspect of reality they are gods in the sense that they are immortal and they they control vast powerful realms and have a great deal of influence over things but the the story and and Gaiman makes it a like purposely draws attention to the fact that they are sort of beyond that um death's one, one of um dream sisters fa most famous quotes is that um she was she was born right after the universe and she'll shut the door when it's done um this idea that as long as the universe exists these these seven things will exist um and and this the seven are destiny which is the oldest brother and they did y'all actually did see destiny he's he's a he's blind and he carries a large book um he's the oldest brother uh death is the the eldest sister who's, who's second to to destiny um then dream they all start with d by the way uh, <laughs> they don't pick that up uh who's the third oldest they make up the older siblings they're sort of referred to in the book they're the more quote unquote the more mature ones they're the ones that play in fewer games i think is how it's phrased um although the the younger siblings love to mess with dream uh because he's his personality makes him fun to mess with, I guess, is, is sort of the, the core crux of it. But um, there's also desire, despair, um, delirium, um, and a missing sibling uh, whose story unfolds over the course of the, the novels, but you eventually learn is destruction. Um, and so those are the seven. They all embody some aspect of the universe that supposedly is built into the web of this whole existence um it is set in the dc universe which is also a fascinating aspect about um so there are superheroes um they are there they play roles some of them like it was weird because gaiman found all these like little superheroes that had like bit parts and various things and and told their story in some way where it intersected with this world of dreams um and um, incorporated them in, in ways that you wouldn't expect. But you also know, like, Batman exists. The Justice League is there. Martian Manhunter is, is, shows up for um, an episode um, for, uh, related to Dream and uh, reveals that his people, like, worshipped him in some aspect long ago. Um, all these sorts of facets. It's, it is a long story. Um, like I have the like collected version of it, and between the two volumes, I mean, it's like that thick. Um, it ran for years. I think it was thirty-four volumes, and um, the story is is one of many graphic novels that um, really started crediting writers of graphic novels for producing what was traditionally not was was beyond pulp and and so there in in the world of literature there has always been this dichotomy between popular fiction and literary fiction um that if you know the history of literature you know that that dichotomy is sort of ludicrous i mean like if you lived during shakespeare's day he would have been popular fiction he would have been stephen king he was the stephen king all my professors from graduate school someone's gonna find me and murder me <laughs> for yeah. saying that like publicly <laughs> but like he was he was popular yeah i don't know no don't tweet that um i think i think my graduate program will like revoke my degree or something <laughs> um, i mean there's also to be honest some racism and some sexism involved in some of these distinctions right like you mean you mean in like what is literary pop versus popular, not in correct. the Sandman? Yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> not in the yeah. Sandman specifically, <laughs> though. Like we talked about, I haven't read it in its entirety, though it's in my house. So, yeah, but I mean, it it was credited with being, and so it's a light right alongside like the Watchmen. Uh, or just Watchmen. I always forget that there's no the in it. Um, and some works by Alan Moore and, um, you know, some, like, Death in the Family and, and some of these works um, by, like, Batman, like, Frank Miller and stuff, started crediting graphic novels as writing characters that show the sort of characterization that was always the hallmark of what we tr considered traditional literary fiction. Um, 
And so it won a, a ton of awards. Um, it is, is still very highly decorated. Um, and the characterization of the main character of Dream, Morpheus, who we follow through, he is he is somehow simultaneously this strange, like estranged god who controls the world of dreaming, but is also just a person who you're frustrated with and like he dates a mortal and they have like bickering fights. Like because of who he is as a person. And he, he is a very like he is somehow and that's what I think is so amazing about it, you get this character who is magical and fantastical and eternal and embodies this strange aspect about the world that's been made up but is also a very real person with a very real personality and you can look to that story and go I know people who are like dream and that's not a thing you get to say about a lot of um you know like characters who are traditionally part of like popular fiction um there a lot of them are characterizations they're um, stereotypes they're cliches um and so it is always appreciative when you can say like i i can see the realness in this this character and that's why i think it's um it's been so popular and has also sort of lasted to this day and so that's my long rant about the sandman um <laughs> so i'll shut up and let other people talk, talk about it all right yeah. welcome to my ted talk yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, I was, so I should I should also yeah. mention because I, I don't think I mentioned I have read the Sandman of a, a GM. It would be weird if I hadn't. Um, <laughs> I I started reading it when I was in high school, when not that long after it came out, um, and. I basically didn't have the money to keep buying all the volumes of it. So I think I had like the first three and I was fascinated by it. The very first volume has the, the um, oldest game, which did make an appearance in this one. And I, that stuck with me like for years. And then when I got out and I had disposable income and I started reading graphic novels again, I was like, I've got to read the Sandman. I've wanted to finish it ever since I started like years ago. And so I immediately went out and just got these omnibuses and, and plowed through the whole thing. So, um, yeah. Um, it, it, there are things in it that really will stick to you. There's quotes and lines that I remembered for over a decade. Um, and I think, I mean, that's what good literature does. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about um, that Kira and I had not read and had knowledge from, like, the zeitgeist, but didn't have any specific knowledge. But Lee, you did read some or all of yeah. Sandman, right? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk yeah. a little bit about, like, your interest in that and kind of where that came from and... Um, I, I mean, I probably can't be quite as comprehensive because honestly, it's been, I read all of them like in a big old rush. Um, I would sit in Barnes and Noble and I would just like sit there and read. <laughs> I, I eventually bought all the volumes, um, but I would just sit there in Barnes and Noble and read it. And like, as at the time I was a really big fan of like anime and manga. So like I, I would always be there reading those comics and I started looking at Sandman because I remember I had a friend in high school and she had given me a notebook and it was like such it was like super beautiful artwork on the front it was like gold and there was a picture of dream on the front of it and it was like such a bizarre image of him because it's like it was the very painterly strokes and he had like this big crazy 80s rock star hair you're... like glam rock all right, do you know what I'm talking I know. about? So it that's so that's the cover of uh, Dream Hunters, which was a um, spinoff series uh, based in Japan. I have that one. It is gorgeous. The artwork in that whole thing is amazing. <laughs> yeah, I I remember like looking at it and being like, this looks like an, a crazy anime, right? So I asked my friend about it, and she was like, oh yeah, no, it's from Sandman. And I think I don't know what it was, but I had I didn't know much about Sandman, but I'd seen Death, the character. Mm -hmm. I think she'd made like several cameo appearances all over different comics and stuff, and I think I she'd even shown up in like the animated series of um, Justice League. I think she made random appearances across a bunch of like comics and TV shows and stuff, where she would just like be there. And it was like a subtle nod to, you know, Sandman existing in the DC universe, but like not really part of the story, right? So I had seen her before and I was kind of like interested. Um, but because of that notebook, I was like, okay, well now I have to read it because that, it looks crazy and it looks beautiful. So I would sit there and I, re I would 
sped read all of the comics in one summer and I honestly can't remember a lot of it because I remember the story was like so dense like you you open a comic book and you expect it to be like images and like you know there's some dialogue but like with Sandman you would open it and it was like 90% dialogue <laughs> and like some art here and there right and it was also like philosophical and introspective and most of it was just like death moping around or not death uh dream moping around his house and like being sad about himself um and i do remember when he took his his mortal girlfriend to like a ball or something and then you got to see everyone there not just the endless but there was like other characters there and they all had like beautiful extravagant gowns and and dream and his girlfriend were having like an argument in the corner or something but um i remember being like really <laughs> taken by the artwork because it had been like nothing i'd ever seen before and then i remember way way later i i picked up um american gods which is a novel by neil gaiman um and it gave me very much the same vibe where it was like these great powerful gods personified with like very human emotion um and also reminds me of like Greek gods and Greek plays where it's like, oh, these omnipotent people, but they all like squabble around like children for no reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always thought that was very funny and a very interesting concept. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so I, I love that you you mentioned some of those aspects of it, because I mean, that is Neil Gaiman is one of the ultimate researchers for like the work he does. Um, there's this really fascinating, like you can see threads on his Twitter where people will tweet to him and be like, um, in this volume of whatever you wrote, you said this, but it's wrong. And he'll respond with like a three part tweet. That's like, actually in like the 1970s, the Oxford English dictionary found blah, blah, blah. Like, and it'll just completely refute. And it's because he, he knows those things because he's done an extraordinary amount of research. And so like his stories are, they're dense and, the other thing I think that is probably contributes to you having trouble remembering it is the Sandman is so disjointed. The story jumps like from section to section to like different people and and what you're and how it's connected to what you're reading is not clear a lot of times. Like you get it maybe by the end, but you'll read pages and pages and you'll be like, Who is this person and why am I why am I reading about them? How is this connected to this? And then it's only towards the end that you're like, oh, like I see this connection. So this is tied to this person. Um, one of the one of the most important yeah. ones in there. No, I remember. Yeah. Go ahead. Like the the first couple volumes I read, I had no idea it was like a story. I thought it was just like mini stories i thought yeah. everything was separate because it is a lot of like well now we're here with this person and here's like a little story about this person and now we're in like a completely different realm and then this is about this other person and they're doing some other thing and now we're into this other so like i thought it was like a collection of short stories um is what i had thought until like halfway through and i was like oh wait a minute this is <laughs> this is all one story okay i see yeah it is, it is strange to sort of read it. And you also mentioned death and her appearances. I mean, Neil Gaiman has said death is his most lasting creation, and she does appear in everything. He's also had, like, two or three spinoff stories that are just about her because she's extraordinarily popular. Um, and uh, he, there, Dream shows up in some of those spinoff stories, too. Like, The Dream Hunters, which is the cover you are talking about, um, is, like, set in Japan. It's about, like, a, a magical fox that falls in love with a monk and the monk gets cursed or something and he can't get out of a dream and the fox has to go talk to Morpheus in order to try to like plead for his help um and it's a it's a gorgeous story like that cover is also one of the things that drew me into it because I remember seeing that when it came out and I was like he looks like a little bit like David Bowie in Labyrinth <laughs> It's like the dark. <laughs> that that is exactly the same thought I had. I remember looking at it and I was like, "Oh my god, I have to know what this is." Oh, That's awesome! It's yeah. a little surprising that it's just now being adapted into TV slash movies. Well, they've tried multiple times. Um, Joseph Gordon Levitt Levitt was um, supposedly going to adapt it, and it fell through. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of rumors about what happened related to it, but um, 
it is i mean it's hard to it's hard to adapt because like the story is disjointed like we've been talking about there's it's like you know if the differences between a graphic novel as a medium and a television series seem minor but when you're telling a story like sandman it's like what are you going to do have two episodes where nobody you've ever seen before it's the story about them and and then all of a sudden then like the last five minutes of the episode you're like oh by the way they were in the dreaming the whole time like is that this is that's not going to play well on tv so it's it's difficult because it's like well how much do you cut and do you tell this just like core story and you ignore all these ancillary things because the ancillary things are actually important one of the one of the ones that i remember standing out a lot because i i remember reading it i'd be like what is this story about um, it's and it's a story about this whole other world called the Necropolis, and it's it's like they bury people when they die, and it's like they bury all the people from all the other worlds, and it's telling the story about like all these different ways that they take care of the dead and the respect they show. It's also a really weird society because everybody's partially dead, which y'all encountered a character from the Necropolis, um, but they aren't dead, but they wear dead people's clothes because those are the only like belongings they have are things that are given to them after people die. And you, it, it's a long story that just like details this society and this weird set of like how they function. And then by the time you get to the end of it, um, the, the endless show up and they're like, we're here to bury our sister who's dead. And, um, which I guess spoilers, uh, <laughs> I should probably say that beforehand. But they're like, we're here to bury our sister. <laughs> and, <Too late. laughs> and they, there's like this interaction and, and between them and, and how it plays out. But that's how you find out the endless can die, which is relevant to the rest of the story that comes thereafter. So you, you like go through all of this story to find out this one detail that is very important for everything that happens like later. Um, so like it's, and so it's hard to tell a story like that in, in video format. So I'm fascinated to see what they do when they adapt it, but it is, I think it will be a challenge. Yeah. Um, okay. I just got very excited because I looked up dream hunters because I was like, I, I want to see that picture again. Cause I haven't seen it in a while. Um, I looked it up and the artist that did it is Yoshitaka Amano. Um, who is a Japanese artist who, if you didn't know, is the character designer for the entire Final Fantasy series. Which makes sense. Very exciting. <laughs> that hair. <laughs> yeah, that does make it fun. does. It does. <laughs> no, I remember like the first time I saw that cover, it reminded me of a very old anime called Vampire Hunter D. Um, and he, I love Vampire Hunter D. <laughs> well, he, he's uh, Yoshitaka Amano is the artist of Vampire Hunter D. So it all makes sense. It all it's all coming together full circle. This is like six degrees of Kevin yeah. Bacon, except not Kevin Bacon. Where's no, Kevin, that, Bacon? Yeah. Not Kevin yeah. Bacon? No, Vampire Hunter D yeah. was like the first the first anime I watched that I knew I was watching anime. I had technically watched anime prior to that, oh, and that I just crazy. didn't know. Yeah. Wait, can I show you guys something? I'll be right back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, ooh, it's showing tell time. Screen. Yes, absolutely. Very exciting. What should we discuss in the meantime? It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> we are live on the we internet. We are live on the internet. Got a vamp. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. I so particularly uh, Kira, since you have not oh. read it, when you hear the title, yeah. what do you think? When you hear the Sandman. What from your experience of the culture before this? So actually, even if I haven't even having not read it, I have spent too much time studying literature and mythology and folklore to not have the right, in the sense, the right understanding. Like even without having read it, I was like, oh, well, I know where this is going. <laughs> not like completely, but I knew we were going to be dealing with some aspect of like, dreams or a dream reality or something that had to do with that so i didn't know exactly but i've also read american god so i thought if it's in the same like vein of his work then i'm like i could start to piece some things together and i was like so i wasn't totally caught off guard by everything that happened to us um i will definitely say the moment that jonathan started explaining the oldest game that was my real moment of panic because i was like i cannot play this game somebody else is gonna have to do this <laughs> That was, like, my only, because, like, you, you know, somebody, you spend a lot of time, if you spend a lot of time role-playing, you get confident in, in certain skills, 
But I was like, the moment he started explaining that game, I was like, oh, no. No, this is not going to be me. I can't do this. I will admit I was super excited about the oldest game. <laughs> because it was one of the things. I knew you would yeah. be, too, when you were like explaining it. I was like, mm-mm, yeah. mm-mm. Before we jump into that, though, I want to see what Lee has. I want to see show and tell. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, show and tell time. Okay, show yeah. show and tell time. Just vamping. <laughs> okay. Um, in 2012, I went to Comic Con in New mm. York, and I got this beautiful poster, and I got it signed by Yoshitaka Amano, Ooh. and he drew a little a little Moogle from Final Fantasy. I don't know <laughs> if you uh, know what that is. Yep. Um, oh yeah. But I couldn't f- I couldn't find it because I also had a piece of paper that I had him sign, and he drew a picture of vampire hunter d on it <laughs> um and i have it framed somewhere but it's it's probably at my parents house most likely but um i was very excited about talking about vampire hunter d because it's been so long since i've heard anyone even say it oh yeah. i accidentally bought two <laughs> copies of the movie we have a weird blue we an extra blue <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it was an accident yeah, though it no. happens yeah no yeah. If you want to talk about Vampire Hunter D sometime, it it is one of my favorite <laughs> stories. I haven't read the manga. I've I tried to find it at one point in time, a long time ago, and it was because it, it's not a manga. It's like a it's what they call them like light novels, right? Where they're it's like a light novel, yeah. Yeah, they have a, like graphics drawn into them. They're very similar to graphic novels, but in my experience the the graphics are less frequent. It's like here's some here's a bunch of traditional prose, then here's uh, image or yeah. two and um because i did read all the light novels for what may be my favorite anime series the melancholy of haruhi suzumiya um oh, no. <laughs> but we won't go okay. down that i was going <laughs> through i think yeah you're turning this into a yeah, that's where it's going anime Sorry. anime podcast all it no <laughs> here it is uh, no that's funny i was going through in my head i was like what are all the light novels what is he gonna say what is he about to say <laughs> Uh, oh, there it is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. classic. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> what did we do? We played a game at some point. <laughs> we did. We played a game within a game. I was like, I can write stories. I can tell you a story. I can write poetry. Yeah. But the moment you start explaining that game, I was like, there's no no one's gonna make me yeah. play this. I can't play this. <laughs> no, I, I I thought it might be super challenging for people. Um, I, I was ready to give people a little bit of leeway on the rules. I wasn't going to tell you I was going to give you leeway. Uh, but I was willing to give you leeway about, like, did you respond immediately? No. Um, sort of thing. But it's it was one of the things in the in the story. And, and I, I really was like, how do I capture this part of the graphic novel? Because in the graphic novel, there's this, like mist that takes the forms as they describe them and they actually have these battles and it's it's animated as much as a graphic novel is animated and so like it really drives home this idea and and dream has these as he's playing the game he has these asides where he talks about playing the game and so you hear his thoughts about it and he describes it in a very literal way like you be as you play this game you become the thing you feel the bite like you feel the pain and then it's weird because then he has to start describing what it's like to become these very like metaphysical things like emotions and concepts and all this other sort of stuff and and um like the idea of hope like how is that um how do you describe and and what is it like to be hope um, so it's a, it was a part of the book that always stood out to me um, because it does appear in the early volumes. And I was like, I want to capture this in some way. And I think it would be a really fun opportunity for some fun role playing for some people who are being bards. But I was like, this is challenging because it does require like, you know, like Im- like true improv. Like you got to be ready with an answer and have that like snap, like right off the cuff um, sort of response. So I was like, oh, I'll be I'll be nice. I won't tell him I'll be nice, <laughs> but I'll be nice. <laughs> right. Like a strict teacher. Um, yeah, that, a couple of things that we've been talking about makes me think about um, one of the questions that we discussed last roll call. Um, so there's so much content with, you know, some of the, the stories that we've done. It's like with the open boat. It's short. And it's definitely short by comparison, right? Um, So for players first, and then maybe for Jonathan, 
Um, were there things that you expected to show up that didn't in knowing what it was going to be about kind of to whatever extent you knew? Um, was there anything in particular that you thought we would encounter that we didn't? I kind of, I assumed that we would run into more of the endless is just what I thought. Um, but I guess it makes sense that I was really worried about we doing would. that. <laughs> <laughs> I so um, I thought death would show up, and then I was like, Jonathan likes death a lot, but also. <laughs> so I yeah, I us, always so. I always run into those situations where it's like, when you're running a one shot or a D and D campaign, like, do you let people meet someone who is extraordinarily more powerful than them? Especially, like, if they don't know it and it's not blatantly obvious. Because, I mean, death is just a cheery person. Like, you you don't really, like, and that's sort of the point of, like, why she's so popular is, is her attitude is such an antithesis to what she does and what her job is. Um, and so I always worry about introducing characters like that because you don't know what players are going to do. And it's one of those things that can be a stopping point for like a campaign, much less a one shot when somebody's like, I decide to like punch death in the face. And it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> like in that case, death would probably not kill you because she's actually pretty forgiving, but um, like desire or despair, either of those, like that would not go well. They love messing with people who aren't doing anything to them. And their ability to control, like, so that's the weird thing. Like, I don't remember if, if it was in the play test or if it was in the actual game where I think y'all, in the actual game, y'all didn't end up in delirium. Um, yeah, okay, so that. one of the doors could potentially take you to delirium's realm. And I had thought about having her show up, but I decided to have the dog that uh, accompanies her show up instead um, because I was like, she wouldn't be any help. <laughs> um, she wouldn't make things worse because being around her as a human makes you more susceptible to her delirium. And so I was like, if, if she shows up, they'll never make it out of her realm. Um, and this is supposed to be like maybe a five to 10 minutes layover in this like longer adventure that they have. Um, but I mean, like she drives just her presence drives the people around her a little cuckoo. Um, and so I was like, the dog that it co accompanies her belonged to destruction. Uh, Barnaby, uh, I think his name was, or Barnabas. Um, and he's helpful. So I was like, well, if they end up in Delirium's realm, then we'll have Barnabas show up to lead them out because he is actually nice uh, and, and won't cause you to go more crazy just by being there. There was a whole mechanic set up for, like, the longer you were there the less ability to communicate you had. So you would try to say things and what you would say wouldn't match what you were trying to say. And eventually it got to the point where when you would open your mouth, like a fish would fly out or, cause that's how delirium's realm works is like complete madness. Well, um, I'm sad what? that we missed the dog. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> of course. At any cost. He has a we talking do. dog. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Why would you tell He's her always that? put out too by everybody's <laughs> Oh, it sounds the things delightful. they ask him to do. Oh gosh. Yep. Well, now I'm sorry. Sad. Mm -hmm. Uh <laughs> Back in the game. Very disappointing. Um, got to go back, got to make different decisions. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're starting now. No. Um so you touched on this a little bit. Uh Jonathan, but if there are other things that you can think of that you would want to add, um, what kind of unique challenges were there for adapting this work to tabletop RPG? So this is, I'm think I'm trying to think through all the works that we've done so far. Um, it is the only comic so far. And like we talked about adapting from one kind of, uh, medium or genre or different genres uh, does definitely offer different affordances and different limitations. But with this one in particular, what kind of challenges did you have? I mean, I gave up on trying to capture the 
feeling of the series because it's too because like we mentioned it's sort of a distorted s- storytelling structure there's it's sprawling like there's so many stories and avenues to go down and so i was like i'm going to tell a story in which they go to the dream world and they're going to meet some of the characters but i specifically tried to keep most of the characters you meeting to like side characters and and people who weren't you know, like you didn't meet Lucifer, you didn't meet um, any of the other endless, like these these very powerful, very influential creatures that exist in here because I was a little worried about, you know, something getting derailed and, and, and going somewhere else. I mean, there's just, there's so much content in there. You, re- I mean, really, I touched a very small portion of it. And I knew that, and that's that's the biggest trick to making these one shots. I think, as 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 I've found that are based on literature, is like you really just gotta like pick five things, pick five things from the story that you want to make sure you do, and you touch on. It's a character, it's an event, it's a place, something, and like focus on that. And because I went, I wavered back and forth whether to bring the kindly ones into it. The kindly ones are. Um, they're a weird amalgamation of so they are the fates they are they are what represents the fates they're also the three witches from the beginning of Macbeth um it literally like this is who they are um they are also like a strange creature and that they are one and all three at the same time which is is another thing that Gaiman does a really great job of capturing this like strange hive mind and I, they were almost the villain you faced but um, I decided not to do that because there's a lot wrapped up in who they are as characters and in order to have them be the villains and, and make sense with the story it would have required that the story went in a really different direction and probably taken five or six sessions so I was like no I'm not going down that road because I think maybe that's that could be too challenging so I decided to make up my own enemy and it sort of was, I, I wanted to capture that idea of the kindly ones um, in that y'all fought, faced a creature that was one and three at the same time, um, but diverged sort of from there in, in its purpose and what it was doing and why it exists and all of that, that sort of thing. Um, but I mean, that's just like one thing. There were there are dozens and dozens of characters and entire stories and worlds and stuff like y'all didn't go to hell hell plays a big role in the whole series um, <laughs> how dare we <laughs> <laughs> come on I... um, yeah you didn't go there I didn't even have the avenue for you to go there because uh, I mean depending on what point in time in the story you go to hell um, it's going to look very very different so uh, I was like, I don't know, this this may be too complicated um, sort of thing. So, yeah, it was just sort of paring it down. And I will say from the play test to the actual stream, like I cut a lot. And I actually changed the structure to make it more of a... Y'all had like two doors to choose between. Um, and you sort of had to go through one of the doors to get to the next two doors and, and eventually arrive where you were trying to go. And the first time in a the playthrough, they had all the doors available to them from the beginning. Um, and that choice sort of stymied them uh, in that they were like, all of these doors could kill us. We don't know what to do, um, <laughs> yeah. which was fair. I mean, the, one of the doors they actually did go through was the one with the Corinthian and they got tacked and one of their players got their eyeball eaten out. And, um, so it wasn't going through doors was not a great experience for them. And so it's like, they became like really scared and hesitant and they had, it, it stymied them. Whereas y'all sort of had like, we can choose and we can, we can make a decision based on the doors and like what they look like. Which, um, the doors were designed, they were random. Like, y'all found meaning in them, but I just sort of described a bunch of doors and then assigned them. Because in the book, like in Dream's Castle, there are doors, and they are just doors that came from people's dreams. And they're not really necessarily indicative of anything. And so I was like, it'll be fun for them to sort of, you know, interpret these doors and try to make sense of them, but... I'm not going to try to put a certain thing behind a certain door um, to make their guesses like right or wrong. I just was like, all right, here we go. Let's just draw some lines. These are the doors that you go to. Yeah, but 
but you took doors away from us, and instead we spent 25 minutes on a mirror. <laughs> we did spend a lot more. T- well, they so they looked in the mirror and saw. We spent a lot of time on the mirror. Yeah, they looked in there and saw the mirror, and they knew there were more doors down the road. And they went, and they just closed, <laughs> just closed that door, and was like, no, no thanks. It's like I don't blame you on that. I mean, your players will dwell on anything. It it happens in every game. Yeah. For sure. That's very true. Um, <laughs> that does um, kind of indirectly lead to a question that I wanted to to make sure that we ask, and we've got about about half an hour left. So we've we've still got plenty of time, but um, so uh, NPCs also something mm-hmm. that players usually get stuck on. It happens often. Uh, are there any NPCs that really stood out? to you as players or to you Jonathan as the DM I mean for me it was pretty obviously the Corinthian just because of what I put by what I literally ran into and then what happened to me so I was like oh (laughs) this was a really bad idea (laughs) maybe I shouldn't have gotten in this creature's face (laughs) Um, so I mean that was that was a big standout for me. and But even aside from that, because sometimes when you're in the game, you can't think about what you're experiencing or anything. So, like, I think that was a really interesting character not knowing the literature itself. Um, so, like, stepping back from that, I think it was just a really cool NPC. And now, like, in the game, you're like, oh, no, now I've lost an eye. But I, but I also appreciate that kind of, like, unexpected encounter where you're like well maybe i'm not gonna die but also this really strange thing happened to me that i now have to like compensate for or figure out how that affects me and that's a part of what i really like about role playing so i think that's one that really kind of stuck with me and i stuck with him it's true <laughs> and your eyes <laughs> stayed with him yep. yep that's right until it didn't because i got it back <laughs> Um, so I, I will say the Corinthian in the book is is a fascinating character because he starts as like an antagonist in the story, and Dream has to go collect him because essentially while Dream's been imprisoned, he's escaped. But then later he becomes a protagonist in the story. Still not a like I would call it what they um what do you call him uh the like the Punisher. There's a word for it. The heroes like who an are anti-hero. Yeah, anti-hero. Uh, <laughs> that's the word I was looking for. Um, he's still sort of a little bit like an anti-hero because he is at his core a nightmare. Like that is literally what he is. But he becomes a protagonist, and the way it happens is is fascinating. And his character development and change is also fascinating. Um, he was I actually went as the Corinthian for Halloween one year. Um, he was one of the th- things that I first heard about the Sandman series and became fascinated with it. I don't remember, I really can't remember how I heard about him, but I remember reading, I went and like looked him up and was reading about him and I was like, this is a weird thing. Like <laughs> this man with hands or mouths for eyes um, that eats other eyes, like it's creepy and weird. And now I'm, now I want to know more about this like story. It. So <laughs> you saw beautiful pictures of Morpheus I heard about a weird eyeball <laughs> eating monster. <laughs> same road, basically, you know? Yeah, ended up in the same place. Yeah. It's true. Yep. I was going to say the librarian, but now I'm heartbroken that I didn't get to meet this dog. So. <laughs> it's this dog I didn't get to meet was my it's favorite NPC. <laughs> that's, that's, my your, favorite. that's the one that stood out for yes. you. Yes. There is a question in the Twitch chat would we have been able to pet this dog? I mean, I guess you could have. As I recall, he's like he's more of a confidant to destruction when in the scenes in which you see him with destruction, like they talk and he treats him like a person. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't rule out pets. I mean, it doesn't rule out pets. Uh I mean, you probably could. I'm trying to remember because I feel like either he doesn't want to be pet petted or he does want to be petted, and I don't remember which one it is. <laughs> I would have asked. But <laughs> would have asked permission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but now that's all I can think about. So. 
bailing on the question. <laughs> bailing on the question. The librarian is also actually um, the librarian is one of the only th the things in the dreaming, one of the only figments or existences that exist there that um, remained loyal to Dream when he was gone. Um, when Dream finally makes it back, um, it's Lucian, the librarian, who's like waiting for him at the castle. So, uh, I mean, good character to, to, to be interested in. Also, I mean, we work for libraries, so. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm a mm, that pit feels like a Mary, Mary Sue, uh, <laughs> written in. I'm not a librarian. Uh, <laughs> silly. Um, yeah. I was also particularly interested in the room where um, they were telling the stories of the end of the world and the not end of the world um, and that like tension yeah that's sort of a thing I made up so there it was it was inspired by a scene and and so so the the in at the end of the world is does exist and it's in there and the, the what you saw out front is is pretty accurate to the way it is in the book like there's a bunch of people they've been pulled from all these different worlds they've all sort of fallen through the fabric of their own world and ended up in this place. Um, and uh, they're telling stories and they can just sort of stay there. The The room at the back um, is a play on sort of what happens towards the end of that. And that is like this strange procession that they see across the sky um, of the end of the world. And they watch it. And I won't tell you what happens there because it's a pretty big spoiler, but um, they watch this like giant, it's like a, a projection across the entire sky. Um, and they watch it all play out. And so I wanted to capture that because I always thought I, that was also something that stood out to me as being a really fascinating part of the story um, and experience for them. And I was like, that might be a really fun experience for the players. And I want and I kept trying to think of like ways to bring y'all into the act of storytelling and use the fact that you were bards to influence the things that you see around you and show you that like dream brought you here because you were bards for a reason, because you that your talents sort of play into um, this world and, and what it takes. And so there was that, that did add that tension in there as like, here's a way for them to sort of tell stories, but I don't, I don't believe that actually sort of functions. Um, I think there is a character who is supposedly like telling the story of the world. Um, but I actually may be confusing that with, um, uh, Italo Calvino's if on a winter's night, a traveler, because there is definitely a character in that story who is telling the story of the world, um, like at all times. Um, so I'm, it's one of those things where if you read a bunch of literature, you start forgetting what <laughs> ideas from which one. And yeah, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what it means to read too much. Read too much. Can you read too much? <laughs> it all, all starts a, becoming one long story in your head. And everything's a remix kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, especially in If I Know When There's Night Traveler, right. literally, it, it, the whole book is remixing every chapter. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, let's see. Lee, do you want to weigh in on an NPC? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I actually really liked Kane. I thought he was kind of funny. Um,. I don't know, just his character was very like, I don't really care that you're here. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I was really trying to wiggle out of the oldest game by <laughs> threatening to stay there for all of eternity and like annoying him to death. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't seem to care about that at all, so. No, no <laughs> he, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> oh, I, no I noticed. Uh... Annoyed his pets. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was like that is that is sort of. I think that's in keeping with him in the book, though. Like he, he. Uh, I mean, he's he's this weird, hot-tempered person, but he's he walks through life untouchable. So like, he also carries that air of like, eh, like whatever, um, about him but he, he is he is grumpy but I, so that's one of the things that sort of was difficult for me because like Kane is a little bit hot tempered 
and he'll murder fast. Like, I mean, but, but in the book, his murdering is always towards his brother. He and his brother are in, because it's Cain, the story of Cain and Abel, they're in a cycle where Cain just continually kills Abel every now and then, and then he buries him, and then Abel comes back to life. Um, and um, so I was like, I don't know. Do, in the book, all of his ire is always sort of directed, seems to be directed towards... Um, you know the his brother but would he direct that towards someone else if they were annoying him i don't know i i, I was a little worried about that he there there is one other scene where um and this was what i was playing off for his personality where um they start try someone else tries to boss him around and he's like he looks at him and goes my contract's not with you my contract is with morpheus with dream um and and then he just like like what are you gonna do about it? Nothing, um, because you're not. And and everybody knows like you like he's the person that Dream sends to like hell when you gotta carry a message. Um, and because no, because it's not you don't touch him. Like that's that's sort of everybody knows that in in Dream's world. Um, he doesn't seem to like having to go to places like that, but. Um, he also knows he's like protected. And so I wanted to embody that. Cause I mean, if you were a character who just knew no one was going to lay a finger on you without terrible repercussions, like you'd, you'd sort of have that laissez faire attitude of like, well, what are you going to do about it? I did appreciate that. You wanted to annoy him though. Cause I was like, <laughs> you put me in a position in which I was like, I'm not sure how to react. I'm not sure if he would just try to kill you or if yeah. he would just go about his day. <laughs> I mean, you know, not a lot to lose, I guess, but I, I just thought it was funny because I have had DMs who try to do, like, met, I don't know characters, but, like, they don't play them well enough like that. You know, like, if I, as a person, annoy you as the DM, it's hard <laughs> to pretend like you're not annoyed, mm -hmm. um, so, but you really, really channeled that kind of, I don't... I've been Whatever annoyed energy. so much. I'm just caught. <laughs> the trick, I'm going to pull that line from the Avengers. The trick is I'm always annoyed. No. Right. <laughs> was that, so, was uh, that the that Hulk was said that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Hashtag always That's annoyed. Right. Always yeah. annoyed. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. And that is, that is a, a difficult, that is a difficult thing. Um, when you give a character... Um, an NPC that kind of personality and you've got to be persistent with it yeah. that can be really hard as a DM well I mean it can be hard for players too like I, I've said on multiple occasions not on roll call but like I, I avoid if I'm going to play a character for an extended period of time playing a character with like low intelligence and that's because I struggle a lot. Like, I can role-play the character with role, low intelligence, but what happens is whenever the character ends up put into a situation where there's, like, a puzzle or something to be figured out, and I figure it out, then I grow really frustrated <laughs> because I'm like, I really, d I really, w I love solving puzzles and stuff, so I really want to solve the puzzle, but I'm like, no, this character is way too dumb to have figured this thing out. And so, like, as a player, I get frustrated because... I know me as a person and that I love to solve puzzles and if they're there, I'm going to want to solve them. And so I have a tendency to be like, I mean, D&D &D and tabletop role playing in general is a game where puzzles are a big part of it. And so I try to avoid playing characters that are going to force me as a person to be frustrated because I can't do part of the game that I enjoy. Um, and like, yeah, like thinking about like playing a character, like really like playing the character as it would be played can be very hard for a lot of reasons. One, it's I'm like, I had someone one time who was talking about being a DM and said, um, they didn't let, um, PC, they didn't let player characters make charisma roles. The characters always had to just be charismatic and their characters reacted to it. And I was like, that's hard. It's hard to be an 18 charisma. Like, <laughs> like that's not fair to them to like, put like, I mean, give it a shot and we'll all assume your character was just a lot better at it than you. If you're not an 18 <laughs> charisma or whatever, but like, but like this idea that like, I, I like making people role play out when they're saying something, especially if they're trying something that's very charisma based and it's sort of a challenging thing. But like, making that be the sole deciding factor of it because 
Like, there are multiple reasons why you can't role-play a character the way it's supposed to be. Like, it may be that you're not whatever stat it is, like, that an, enough of that stat. You're not wise enough, you're not smart enough, you're not... Or you're you're wiser, you're smarter, you're more charismatic than this character. Um, but then there's also, like, something about playing that character is frustrating in certain situations. Like, I like solving puzzles, and I don't like being able to not solve the puzzles when they come up in the game. And so, like, there are a lot of challenges related to that. And as a DM, because I'm not as invested in the, piece, the NPCs, it's easier. But as a player character, like, if you'd presented that to me, I don't think I would have done nearly <laughs> as well at not being annoyed and having the character be very annoyed at it. Well, I mean, that makes a point that, of something that stood out for me in this game because some of us who are uh, having this conversation right now recently wrapped a, a, an epic level campaign where I played a character with exceptionally high charisma, but it didn't manifest as, oh, everybody loves this person and does what she can convince them to do what she wants. That's not how she functioned at all. Um she was kind of on the other side of that spectrum, a little bit manipulative, a little bit deceptive, a little bit dishonest until it didn't suit her anymore. Um, so for me, one of the fun things was playing a, about trying out a bard was playing a high charisma character who was charismatic in this more traditional way that you're talking about. Somebody who is an entertainer and an influencer, for lack of a better word. You know, someone whose livelihood depends on that charismatic aspect as opposed to a character that I had come off of playing whose livelihood didn't quite depend on that in the same way like <laughs> now i'm picturing your um, character so being think... like hey come check out my stream i'm gonna need you to hit that like button like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean that's the isn't that kind of you know we, yeah. we set ourselves up we, we didn't really talk about this tonight so much but we set ourselves up as a traveling circus trip mm -hmm. that was you know if that's your livelihood you're depending on charisma you know, on charisma in that I don't know why I don't want to call it stereotype, but maybe the first way you might think of charismatic, but charismatic can manifest in so many different ways, especially when you're playing a character who maybe isn't, isn't in an environment where they're not going to be appreciated regardless, or they're going to be looked down upon for one reason or another. So how do you, you know, playing that in a high charisma way is totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. Which, yeah. yeah, which, which, so this, that was a lot of fun for me. It was like, oh no, I'm going to play somebody who's charismatic but who's actually fun to be around and has this like, I'm going to go out and gamble attitude and this is how I do my showmanship thing. And <laughs> and specifically picked magic that was designed to, if the audience wasn't giving her enough, she could give it to herself. Like took, <laughs> took spells that were like, I can create the sound of applause if I'm not getting enough of it. And like, <laughs> that didn't get to do too much with that, but that was how, because I get very invested in backstory. Is that like buying followers? And that's a big challenge. On like, Twitter? Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> like it what's how do you you know wait like you get really invested in backstory maybe you don't need that much backstory for wait a minute a one-shot character is but. is money the real world equivalent to fantasy world's magic <laughs> yes the answer is yes <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that depends on who you ask but yeah. like yeah i think that was something really cool that i i enjoyed playing with the concept for nithvari it was like somebody who really thrives on that <laughs> Yeah, and we've we've gotten into talking about mechanics of the game a little bit, so I think that's probably um, a good time to see if we have anything else we want to expand upon this. So when we played this game, we were including like your history with the work and your history with role playing games in like the introduction during the role of play session, and we're going to kind of transition that to roll call. Um, so mm -hmm. we talked about, um, you know, this was based in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, um, which is a very popular, uh, role-playing game edition. Um, we're not going to get into the arguments of what the best role-playing, <laughs> like, tabletop role-playing games are. That's not... That's, that's Kayla's standard disclaimer. Yeah. We're not going to get into the debate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um... How did, I guess, having the experience that you have had in 5th um, in edition or in other um, tabletop RPGs, how did that impact how you played in this one shot? I think the nice thing about playing a new class for me in this case was I already understand the mechanics of 5e. So I didn't have to worry about 
how do I play a bard or what? There's already enough to remember of, like, I'm playing something I've never played before, like, forgetting about inspiration for half the game, because it's not a, me it's not a mechanic I'm used to. But I didn't have to worry about the other mechanics of, I know how combat works. I know, actually, interestingly learned in this session that um, having uh, played a warlock recently, like, the spell mechanics actually aren't that different in some ways. So I was like, oh, I get this. Like, it started to click in my brain pretty quickly that I understood how that worked. So I, those are a couple of things for me that definitely jumped out. Uh, I've only ever played 5th edition, so um, it was <laughs> fine. I've heard some like horror stories about 3rd edition, um, so I'm glad I never did that. Uh, <laughs> sorry to anyone that likes it. Um, yeah. But yeah, playing a new a new class was fun, um, but I, I already had a grasp on how general mechanics worked and also once again, because this game wasn't like that combat heavy and it was more centered around just like general puzzle solving, um, it was pretty easy, I think. So, um, I mean, it might have been harder if I'd never played fifth edition, but uh, it, it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, is this the session where you'd want to wet your feet on fifth edition? I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, but you yeah. might say the same thing about the Alice in Wonderland one, and that worked really well for Danny. She did super well at it. That's true. I mean, That's if you true. if you didn't know the rules and you weren't thinking about your spells and someone was just like, tell me a story, I mean, you might yeah. just think that's what Dungeons & Dragons is. Like, oh, just make up story. Like, <laughs> I mean, isn't it? I mean, it is, that but it's, a lot of it. it's <laughs> that, but then you also do math. Yeah, sometimes it's <laughs> a little That's true. There is a lot of math. Yeah. If you are not familiar with D&D, there is a lot of math. I Unless mean, you... less math than there used to be. Mm. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. Having come from AD&D, yeah. I agree yeah. with that completely. I had a, we when we used to play 3.5, I had a macro, roll a dice macro that rolled like five attack rolls at once and added like 40 to them. It was ludicrous. Like it was not <laughs> 40 points. Like there's a lot of math. I was like, I would have hated having to do this manually. <laughs> Yeah. We have a comment in the chat about the final boss combat that uh, did oh. not leverage standard mechanics, really, uh, for 5th mm -hmm. edition D&D. &D. Um, yeah. Which was, like, as someone who has played a bard before and enjoys bards, I mean, if I'm being honest, I've played bards multiple times, uh, at least Playing twice. a bard right now in another right, game. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hashtag bard life. Bards and druids forever for um, you, right? I mean, they're just great. They're just great. <laughs> um, but it was difficult to to get to that final boss fight and not be able to leverage the tools of my mm -hmm. bard uh, in the way that I may be more used to, um, which I think may have been made a little more difficult because I knew what the tools were <laughs> and was yeah, comfortable uh, with but, the But I want to use them. Yeah. But those are my I tools. was pretty happy with that because I realized everything I had, uh, the Corinthian had been immune to. So, um, you know, the thought, oh no, anything we encounter. I mean, we were warned not to do too many charisma based <laughs> spells. Charm spells, yep. But Or, or charm spells, but um, I didn't listen and I was like, no, but this is what Clown would do. And I paid for it with the Corinthian, but uh, I in my head I was like, we're gonna get to this final boss, and I'm not gonna be able to do anything because I already burned my my third level spell <laughs> slot for nothing. Um, but then we didn't have to do any of that, so I was like, oh, okay, yeah. great. <laughs> I can still be effective. Yeah. So the same thing that happened to you also happened to one of the playtesters. They got to the Corinthian, and they were like, oh, all my spells are like charm spells. Uh, He's not, he's immune to charm. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and so, yeah, that was one of the challenges. And, um, mm -hmm. sure. yeah, I don't, I don't blame you. It's always frustrating when you're playing and you get to something and you're like, but the thing I do. Yeah. <laughs> the thing I, I can do only do one yeah. thing. <laughs> and I'm thinking back to that session zero we had where we were just like, or at least before the session when we were talking about 
like spells because we're like okay well if we're avoiding charm spells we should try and like spread ourselves out but we still found ourselves i think like at least two or three of us had vicious mockery (laughs) at least two or three of us had dissonant whispers you know so we still found ourselves wanting to do the same kinds of things and maybe for different reasons like i know i'm very intentional with my spell casters about what i'm choosing for one reason or another but (laughs) but like vicious mockery is like the most fun thing so of course we (laughs) don't pick that I mean, let's be honest. Bards are basically just comedians at a roast. That's not <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's not that's true. <laughs> College of Devotion I... is very different. <laughs> anyway. Uh. No, 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 no. <laughs> we were we were gonna be a troop of roasters, and I was like, what would be funnier than like a clown that just insults people, and and they take damage for it. Um, so that was my whole thing and you warned me not to do it but I was already set I was like I'm gonna I mean it worked out only one character lost an eye and that character didn't lose and I only lost one I almost lost the other one because there is a very real she got it back so yeah there is a very real chance to lose both Mm mm-hmm I mean, on the note of spellcasting, I will say I was really sad I did not get to use pyrotechnics at any mm. point. But yeah. <laughs> Y'all had that stage performance. The moment did not come. I did specifically set That's that stage true. performance up so that y'all could do whatever it is that you as, like, a troop, like, wanted yeah. to do. Um, and just, like, have fun performing as bards. Um, yeah. Because I think they just give you food at the end, at the end of the world. I don't think you actually have to, like, tell us. You may, actually. I may have actually pulled that from there, but um, I was like, I'll set up a stage. That way they can actually, like, be bards because there's not a lot of opportunity for you to, like, perform. And I I know I was like, I'm making a big deal of this in, like, session zero that y'all need to be a troop. But partially that is so, like, it makes sense why you end up here. Not as much, like, once you're here, you're going to go, like, do a circus performance or a so uh, also for the record the playtest group was an air gu- air guitar band <laughs> air instrument band <laughs> that's what their wow. troop was uh, so that's a thing you can do yeah <laughs> they all use their they would use their magic to make the music from their instruments instead of actually playing any instruments but they were all playing fake instruments um, <laughs> it was funny but knowing who that in, was in that group that makes perfect yeah. sense yeah. to me yeah 100% <laughs> um but I did want to give y'all a chance to like actually be a be a bard troop at least once because I know you probably would only get one. Real yeah. air instruments is uh-huh. is the comment in the chat. Just for the record, our producer Alice was part of the playtest group. Yep. <laughs> That's why she's That's true. <laughs> saying um, this. Let's see here. That's why she's getting real defensive <laughs> in the chat. There. We are. We're getting closer to the end of our time. Um, so I want to. Uh, kind of transition into looking forward um so what other works of literature or media do you think uh may give someone a similar experience as the work that we focused on for this session if you were going to make a recommendation for i mean i think a lot of people have already said it at this point american American gods Gods. (laughs) yeah i mean that would be you know kind of where i might jump to or um, that's definitely the first one that I think would come to mind. Not only because it's by Neil Gaiman, but because it encompasses a lot of that. Like I, th- I think um, Lee has a really great like analysis of that, and that it's the same. It's it's sort of like Neil Gaiman likes telling the story of the Greek gods over and over, but in different contexts of like <laughs> this idea of people who have enormous power but are squabbling and bickli- bickering and <laughs> are like very much more focused on what we would consider like mortal concerns than their godly concerns. Yeah. In the chat from KMS at VT, we have uh, Name of the Wind as mm. a suggestion. Oh. I'm not familiar. Yeah, that would potentially. That's Patrick Rospis. Oh. Uh, I am currently reading that that first book. I am not very, I'm, I'm not too far into it yet, but as little as I am into it, that would... Um, that might have the same sort of vibe, yeah. That's that storytelling of over time, and yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff you could do with that. Yeah, I can see that. Mm, what else? I mean, my mind keeps going to other graphic novels, just because I think 
there's a certain tone to this whole world of certain like I call I have a tendency to call them like the serious graphic novels, even though mm. like that's not a fair like way of phrasing them. But like <laughs> there's like all the like the Alan Moore stories and stuff that are all very um, like this is a politically charged like tale of deep characterization and personal sacrifice. Like um, it's not to say like other graphic novels and comic books aren't that way, but I tend to lean towards those just there's a certain nature of that but I don't think I'll honestly the story that we've already done the Alice in Wonderland one in the sense of this like malleable world mm-hmm. um, if you haven't noticed yet I seem drawn to stories like that where <laughs> where you know the the world is fantastical and I can break the rules of D&D and it still makes sense yeah so I think those are great great recommendations um, other things. Lee, Lee, did you have are one? There? Aside from American Gods. <laughs> yeah. Aside from American Gods, I mean the. Uh, I I don't know if I can think of anything like similar in terms of content, um, <laughs> but like I would recommend Fables, um, by. Bill Willingham, I think is his name, and it, it's a comic series, and it's like a retelling of, uh, you know, classic, like, Snow White, Beauty and the Beast, those sorts of things, um, but with like a, each of them have like a more realistic spin to them, I suppose, um, but the art is pretty similar, and I think it falls into the vein of like a uh, s- serious comic <laughs> Yeah. Kind As of the style. scholar Jonathan so. Bradley has Tra- trademark, <laughs> trademark, right, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. yeah, cool. Well, and there's there's a whole other series, like a whole uh, not series, not a particular series, but um, you know, my like aside from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, there were you know a half a dozen other authors in that same time period who were writing fairy tales for children that produced things that would you know, give you a similar sort of environment or element. So like George MacDonald's The Back of the North Wind, um, which if you're not familiar with that story, it's really great. It's about a little boy who travels behind the North Wind and goes on an adventure. Um, but there are a whole bunch of those like short Victorian short, short, short stories for kids that would have that sort of weird element of people, of, of children crossing boundaries into places that are not the reality they're used yeah. to. I, uh, made me mm-hmm. think of if we ever start um, like adapting movies as well um, Mirror Mask mm-hmm. which is actually was like the art director was Dave McKean who worked on the Sandman but um, it you know it's this fantastical world where everything's sort of dreamlike and, and strange and um, you know you're going on a, this adventure uh, in that place I think that could have a similar feel yeah that makes sense um, and while we're looking forward, are there upcoming sessions that you're particularly excited about of the role of play? I'm excited like. about all of them. <laughs> 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 this is a time in the podcast to allude to future mm. role yep. of play games. Okay, fine. Then I will <laughs> I will shamelessly self promote. Uh, and say that at the end of February, um, I will be, uh, well, at that point, I will be GMing 5E for the second time, because we are going to run a play test in the next couple of weeks. But live on the internet will be my second time ever uh, DMing a 5E campaign that will be based on um, basically the first collection of short stories around Sherlock Holmes and a couple of the earlier novels. Um, already taking a book from a uh, page from Jonathan, I've decided to focus on the first half of the home stories and potentially leave the second half open for some later activity. Ooh, a sequel. <laughs> um, yeah. A sequel. So uh, we're going to try and figure out how to mash uh, Victorian London into a fantasy world. Oh. <laughs> and what happens when those worlds collide. That sounds great. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm also excited because in two weeks we're doing a sequel to Alice's Adventures yeah. in Wonderland. That was my uh, turning it over. Yeah. <laughs> is it in a week or is it in It's in a week. Weeks? You're, you're week. right. I'm yeah. wrong. Two yep. weeks from now, we'll Not be tomorrow, doing another Not tomorrow, but a week episode. from tomorrow. Yeah. A week from tomorrow. We'll be right so here on Twitch. 
playing, playing uh, the sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which will be based on Through the Looking Glass. I mean, roughly based. I mean, I jumped back and forth between the two stories a little bit, pulled some elements just due to the nature. We talked about that in Roll Call. Alice in Wonderland is, is yeah. the two books are too muddled. They're just one story at this point, and they're hard to distinguish between the two. But this one will a little bit more explicitly focus on Through the Looking Glass. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, definitely keep an eye out for that. And if you, viewers, have suggestions of stories that you think would be great for adaptation, works of literature, uh, graphic novels, short stories, um, you can uh, include that when you reach out to us at rollofplay-g at vt.edu, which has been in the chat, um, and I'm sure will be coming back around. Um, and also, if you are a member of the Virginia Tech community or the local New River Valley community or involved with libraries, there's a lot of concentric circles happening here. If you're involved in any of those areas and you want to get involved, then you can follow the link in the chat, bit.ly forward slash role of play with a capital R and a capital P um, to reach out to us. Um, also in the future, if you would like to uh, ask questions of our panelists during roll call, you can use hashtag VTUL roll call on Twitter and mostly on Twitter. I'm not going to go check I've all the places. I've already tweeted with it, so hopefully, <laughs> yeah. hopefully it'll work, Kayla. I've started <laughs> tweeting with it. Yeah. And, uh, oh, good. That's also in our chat. Um, and you can you can send your questions to the um, to the email or to the Twitch page. We'll be collecting them throughout the week and asking questions live uh, that are collected during each session. Um, I think those are all of my announcements. I think, yeah. So uh, so with that, we will be back here in two weeks for more roll call. Um, what is our topic in two weeks? Winnie, Winnie the, Pooh. the Pooh. We're going to talk about Winnie the Pooh Honey Heist. Excellent. <laughs> so in two weeks, we'll be here to talk about Winnie the Pooh and uh, how that honey heist went. It was delightful. If you want to, um, you know, brush, brush up, up yeah, on, uh, on the game. <laughs> Whatever we call it. Yeah. Yep. It is on our YouTube channel, which is linked on our Twitch page. Mm -hmm. um, we are preparing to raid somebody. We're going to raid um, oh. NC North Carolina State Libraries. University. Yep. Libraries. Yeah, North Carolina State University Libraries. Uh, right, right about now. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, thanks, thanks everyone who's viewing uh, live or on VOD. Uh, and huge thanks to Alice, our uh, fearless producer. Oh, update. Raid's not working. Raids are not working. Never mind, we're not raiding today. <laughs> we're not working. We're not uh, raiding because it's not working. But we can encourage you to check out other libraries. Libraries do cool stuff. Um, and mm -hmm. we'll be back here doing cool stuff uh, soon. Wednesday will be the next live thing, I do believe. Yep, Archival Adventures. Yeah, Archival Adventures with Anthony, who is excellent. And we have cool archives. So come check them out. I want to see how long we can get Kayla to just keep vamping. <laughs> We're good? Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, <laughs> for being here. Have a good night. Bye. 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 <laughs> we got a Muppet wave. It's very important that the Muppet wave... <laughs>